Janelle was a happy little girl. She loved making gifts for her friends. She was a very giving person. Janelle, as she was growing up, was just really coming into her own. We were very proud of her. My sister and I were three and a half years apart and had a good sibling rivalry going on. I was 16 and she was 12. A few days before Christmas in 1984, Janelle Matthews all of a sudden vanished without a trace. There was no evidence in the home. There was no DNA, there was no latent prints. It is most likely the largest case that I will be a part of in my career as a police officer. And not knowing what happened haunted us all over the years. This case that horrified this entire community for decades, for 35 years, there really was no suspect. People held their children closer. Doors were being locked. Curfew was being enforced. There's so many years in between the incident and them actually finding the corpse. The perpetrator was very confident, perhaps even complacent, about getting away with it. He didn't know us. He didn't know Janelle. Was it just Janelle happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time? I can't forgive the person who shot my daughter right in the head. First school picture and her last school picture. Yeah. Mm. I like those pictures. Yeah, I love this picture right here. The two of them. Jennifer was more like her dad. Janelle was more like me, more of a homemaker. Janelle looks a lot like Gloria. And nobody ever would have guessed, without being told, basically, that she was adopted. I think Gloria and I never felt like it was different. We felt blessed that we had Janelle. We felt blessed that we had Jennifer. And uh, we never kept the fact that Janelle was adopted from her. She was always, uh, a, in our opinion, she was a chosen child. And uh, that's how we approached it. I didn't even probably know what the word adopted means, so it didn't change anything. I don't know any different. I don't have biological siblings, so she was my sister. A lot of things we did were church activities. Church was life. If the church doors were open, my family was there. We were involved in choir, we were involved in plays. Janelle loved to sing and dance and act. So that was a very central point in our family's lives. December 20th, 1984, just was a normal day for me. I would get up, go to school, hang out with my friends, even a little bit after school, and then came home. It was the last day before Christmas break. Janelle was very excited to give her gifts to her friends the next day on Friday. My mom was flying to California to surprise her parents for Christmas. My grandfather wasn't doing well physically, so she just wanted to spend time with them. Before I left, the four of us went down to the family room and we had apple cider. And Janelle was saying, well, how about our Christmas? And I said, well, I'm gonna come back on the 26th and we'll spend our Christmas uh, then. You know, we're just gonna postpone it for one day. 
and then people started to leave the house. Gloria got picked up to take her to Denver for her flight. I took Janelle to the school and saw her get on the bus to go to the Christmas concert with the choir that she was in with her friends. I liked singing with Janelle. We attended church together. She was my first friend that I met in Greeley. We'd either go to each other's house and play or, or do something together. Before school, we had the honor choir together. This is our concert from December 20th, 1984. Um, there's Janelle front row and center singing loudly. She loved Christmas carols. It wasn't a concert where parents came and sat down to listen. It was just something that was filmed on the local cable television show. So there was no congregation to listen to. My dad just dropped her off at her school to ride the bus, and then she was gonna get a ride home so that he could come to my basketball game. Sometimes I think about, well, what would have happened if I had gone to the concert and not the basketball game? But you can contemplate on that, and uh, you can't relive it. Janelle needed a ride after the concert. She saw my dad pull in and said, hey, I'm going to go with Deanna and her dad. And she jumped in the truck with us, and we took her home. So we dropped Janelle off. She turned around and waved goodbye. See you tomorrow. I said, see you tomorrow. Walked inside, flickered the light on and off, and that was our signal to let us know that she made it in. And um, my dad and I continued home. After the basketball game, I came home, and it was approximately 9.30. When I walked in, I said, hi, Janelle, and I didn't get a response. And I thought, well, maybe she was upstairs and didn't hear me. So I went downstairs and came back and noticed that the quartz heater was on next to the chair that she probably had been sitting in, and the TV was on. So I went upstairs, thinking she was up there, and I looked in her room, and, and there was no Janelle. When I came home, my dad was concerned as soon as I stepped inside the house and just asked me if I knew where Janelle was. And right away I knew that something wasn't right because we wouldn't have gone anywhere at that time at night. So for her not to be in the house was just something to be concerned about from the get-go. My dad had received a call later on that evening I was asleep at the time, so my dad had woken me up, asking me if I knew where Janelle might be in the neighborhood. I don't know that I realized the full magnitude of what was happening. I thought for sure, if she's not here, she's somewhere, right? I, I really didn't quite understand it, being a 12-year-old. I sat and was supportive of my dad while he called a few other of Janelle's friends, just to see if she perhaps was there. And then when he called our pastor and he said to call the police. And the police arrived shortly after my dad had called them. The initial officer arrived on the scene at about 11.15 that evening. It's a really surreal feeling police in my room, putting fingerprint dust on the walls. And, you know, that's just something that was never in my wheelhouse. I didn't know anything about it. So it was all really, really strange. Investigators didn't find much as far as physical evidence. There was no sign of a physical disturbance. There was very little evidence that was collected within the house. DNA was not a thing in 1984. Fingerprints were dusted, but none were found. She'd essentially left everything as it was. The only evidence were shoe impressions that were found around the exterior windows of the garden level of the residence. 
there was snow on the outside and there were footprints in the front yard and in the backyard, like somebody had been looking in the windows. What was concerning was most of those shoe prints had been raked out. Somebody took a rake in the snow and raked out all of the footwear impressions in the backyard. I don't think fear set in at that time, just thinking that maybe in the morning there would be some answers or she would come home in the middle of the night. Most of the time when somebody doesn't show up at a certain time, maybe they ran away. Because a lot of times runaways leave a note. Well, there was no note from Janelle. So when I finally arrived in Los Angeles, it was almost one o'clock in the morning. And I called Jim up and I said, hi, honey, I'm here. That was well into the night and she still wasn't home. And that was a call that I was dreading. I knew right away, my stomach didn't feel good. And Jim says, um, Glow, I don't know how to tell you this. But we don't know where Janelle is. And that's, that's when the nightmare started. I think not only did Gloria feel sick, but uh, she wanted to come home. I got home the next night, and I remember crying on the airplane the whole time. Somebody came into our house and violated us. It had to be a stranger. It had to be a person who did not know us or didn't know Janelle. I tried really hard to be brave. But we didn't know anything about Janelle from that night on. In 1984, Greeley was roughly 55,000 people. The police department itself was very small. Not a lot of experience with something like this. Stranger abductions are exceedingly rare in law enforcement. So being able to make that determination that it is a true missing person case and not a runaway juvenile case is of utmost importance. When I arrived at school the next morning, there was counselors taking me out of class. And I remember that's probably when I realized that Janelle, something happened to Janelle and she was missing. I was taken to school in a police car, which is highly abnormal. Just life was not as we knew it. I knew that she was going to come home. I mean, if she were a runaway, which we didn't think that she was, you know, she would come back because she wouldn't miss Christmas. Early on in the case, the attention for the most part was given to the family that perhaps it was somebody within the family who was responsible for the disappearance. Given the evidence that we had, we quickly were able to eliminate any and all suspects, including the family. For a few days, there was a lot of activity. There was helicopters canvassing the neighborhood in the area. I remember just watching them and just processing everything that they were doing to find Janelle and not knowing how long this was gonna last. That Christmas, I set the table for four rather than for three. For a long time, I included her in everything, but she wasn't there.
so many memories we have forgotten. But what I remember about Janelle was her being happy and being feisty at the same time and loving. When you have a missing child, you want to get her face in front of as many people as possible. We got the national exposure that we were trying to get. Later on, President Reagan came out and was talking about missing children and mentioned our daughter, Janelle. Janelle Matthews of Greeley, Colorado, who would have celebrated a happy 13th birthday with her family just last month. But five days before Christmas, Jonelle disappeared from her home. We learned pretty quickly that the longer that a missing child is missing, the greater chance that something evil has happened. Because there was so little clues involved, after the first six, seven months, we didn't have a whole lot of contact with the Greeley Police Department because there wasn't a whole lot to report on. Within about a year, I would say, the case would go cold. Definitely by the end of 1985, there just weren't any more leads. Not knowing was a big thing. But not having her around was even bigger. We never forgot Janelle, never forgot her birthday and Christmas. Those were difficult days. But you can't let it consume you so that you start shutting down. And so life became what you and I might consider more normal, just with the years starting to go by. I got married a few years later. I had my son. So my life was progressing typically, but always in the back of our minds was, are we ever gonna know what happened to Janelle? This case was getting leads called in from all across the country. People would say they spotted Janelle or they had a lead. While initially promising, they are sort of always tracking down these tips and didn't really get to see the evidence that was there and really work it. As we got close to the 10th anniversary of her abduction, we had a memorial service at our church. That was the turning point for all of us, to lose hope that she's probably not out there. It wasn't obviously complete closure because we didn't know what happened to her. It was just kind of like relief, relief of that burden that had been on our shoulders for 10 years. We never blamed God for doing this to us. We never did. But I did question God why we never found her. I couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept the fact that we would never find her. I got involved in the case in 2013. I grew up in this community, and to be able to work on it firsthand and be assigned it was an honor for me to try to solve it for the family. The size of the case is enormous. That's why I enlisted Detective Prill to come and organize it with me. So I had to track down all the police reports, which were strewn everywhere. And so I would spend uh, somewhere around 14 to 16 months just bringing this very old case in the, the 21st century. And so my hope was that perhaps a suspect comes to light. This case got nationwide attention. And so your common kooks came out of the woodwork. They're reporting all these strange ideas that they had about where Janelle might be. The one thing that stuck out from the onset was a guy named Steve Pankey. He had reached out to the lead detective by phone January 19th of 1985, almost a month after Janelle disappeared. Steve Pankey was another attendee of the church that the Matthews family went to. 
He had been excommunicated due to assaults that he was alleged to have committed on another parishioner. He purportedly hated the church and hated authority, despite the fact that he himself ran for sheriff and governor on multiple occasions. This is Steve Pankey. As Idaho's next governor, I intend to keep simple issues simple and bring together competent people to resolve Idaho's complex issues. A picture of Pankey during his run for governor in the state of Idaho failed miserably, but he put himself out there. Steve Pankey inserted himself into the case asked if the detective would share information about the case to him to see if it matched up with information that he might have with the case. He added there was definitive evidence that Janelle had been kidnapped and was likely dead. So he's the first human on the planet to claim Janelle's dead. In fact, the, the kidnapping itself, we don't know. She could have run away. The guy just came in and talked bad about the church and try and point the blame to that church. At the time, the detective decided that he was a fringe element and didn't deserve any more attention. They didn't really take it that to heart because they never had any reason to. Uh, there was nothing that linked him to Janelle Matthews. They had no reason to think he was involved. Maybe he was a bit nosy in their minds, but they didn't really consider him a suspect. I turned it all over, the entire case file. It's all done now, Roger. And here's your follow-up list. And it was literally hundreds of things he had to do. And that was 2015. I remember what I wrote in my follow-up list for Robert was, Panky, comma, what's up with this guy? As time really went on, decade after decade, that's when it kind of starts becoming a question of, is she still alive? Nighttime is hard for my mom. I think you can kind of go to some dark places of what might be happening to your child. And we had some air vents and I can just hear her crying through the vents. In April of 2019, I had my first and only conversation with Steve Pankey regarding the Janelle Matthews case. Pankey was very leery, very suspicious of law enforcement's intentions. Pankey, when he answered the phone, said, I need a deal. I need my attorney to be involved before I talk to you. That's not normal. I told Robert we need to go to Twin Falls, Idaho and have a meeting with Mr. Pankey. And we started making plans to go out there when the Well County Sheriff's Office was notified by an oil company scraping the ground uh, to prepare for this next pipeline, and a skull came out of the ground. Well County drove out, took a look, and said, that's clearly human. Uh, I was the on-call detective for the Greeley Police Department. I received a call saying that the Weld County Sheriff's Department was on a site where one of the pieces of heavy machinery lifted up what they thought was a bag of garbage, and it turned out to be clothing and skeletal remains. And there were braces on the teeth of the skull. Janelle Matthews, when she went missing, had just had braces put on her teeth. The mere fact that it could be Janelle Matthews was surreal, it was otherworldly. A feeling that I have not had before. The body was found in this general area. The remains were lifted up. It was estimated that there were three to four feet of dirt covering her body. There was no soft tissue the state of the remains were skeleton. You could see all of her clothes that she wore the night of the recital. He called me and said, hey, no doubt this is Janelle. These remains were then taken to a forensic pathologist 
who through DNA analysis identified the remains positively as Janelle Matthews. We didn't want anything to get out to the media. We needed to call the family to advise them of the discovery. July 25th, never forget that day. I got this uh, phone call from Robert. He said, Jim, we think we've found Janelle's remains in a shallow grave. Yeah, it just, boy, it hit. And so we go to ourselves. We're getting some closure now. Now we know what happened to Janelle. I was in total shock. It automatically made me think that this was just a miracle, that they found her, and how they found her was just incredible. This is 35 years after her disappearance. Even the bones themselves were beginning to uh, decompose. The fact that that earth mover had just barely scraped over the top of her and pulled her skull out. Had it been just a little higher, a half a foot deeper, no one would have ever seen her. Is divine intervention, that's all it is. As we were recovering the remains, we were looking for any signs that could tell us how she was killed. It was at that point that we saw that there was a penetrating wound through the skull. They shared with us how she died. That was brutal uh, because she had been shot in the head. Then you have to shift to another very sad realization that she was murdered. But there was also, on the flip side, some comfort knowing that perhaps she didn't suffer long. We made the arrangements for Janelle's memorial. This is the last final celebration. That second service, it was just a lot of overwhelming feelings. You see her casket of just, that was just holding skeletal remains and how small that was just really hit me that she was just a child. August 15th of 2019, Robert Cash and I made the nine hour one way drive to Twin Falls, Idaho. This is Steve Panky. Panky mailed a letter August of 2013 to the district attorney's office and we never received it. The DA's office had it. Amongst other letters, we discovered Panky had written. Steve Panky's name had not been mentioned in that investigation since January of 1985. He provided them unprovoked with an alibi letter that has very detailed information about where exactly he was the day of the murder and disappearance. Why would anyone remember one year ago, let alone 29 years ago, where they were at on a day that was otherwise meaningless to them? We knocked at his door. We introduced ourselves. Panky immediately insisted he needed immunity, which means I can't be prosecuted for anything that I might admit to, any crimes. I explained to Panky that there is no crime that he can be charged for in 2019 that occurred in 1984, except for first degree murder and first degree kidnapping. He said he understood that and he still asked for immunity. So as far as I'm concerned, he just confessed to me that he murdered Janelle. And then he stopped talking, turned and he walked away. Detective Prill did ask about a Steve Panky all three of us had no clue on who he was talking about. We never heard of Steve Banky. We did not come to that church till summer of 1978 when he was already excused from the congregation. 
I know a lot of times I come through as kind of a deadpan candidate and uh, my delivery isn't as good as it should be. And I apologize for that. However, I think the substance is there. And anyway, I really need your prayers. Uh, God's will be done. Thank you. In an effort to learn more about Steve Pankey, I'd learned that Angela Hicks was his ex-wife, that they had been divorced for some time. So I figured she would be a good person to talk to about him. When Robert called Angela, Angela started her phone call with, why has it taken you so long to call me? Angela Hicks had had numerous conversations with law enforcement in Idaho. Officers said that they had collected all the information that she had gathered and then forwarded all the information to the Greeley Police Department. It was news to me as I had no idea. Nothing had been sent to the Greeley Police Department as it related to what she had been talking about. Angela Hicks described conversations with Steve Pankey in the 1990s. At that time, Steve Pankey was having conversations with law enforcement in the Idaho area where they were living, and he said it was about the Janelle Matthews case. It was at this point that Angela Hicks said that her blood ran cold, that she immediately started thinking about Steve Pankey's activities and movements and behaviors in and around the disappearance. Angela said she knew that Janelle disappeared on December 20th. She said on the evening of the 21st, Pinky walked into the house and said, we're going to California for Christmas. We're leaving in the morning. And she's completely shocked. They drive to Big Bear, which is about a 20 hour drive. They arrived and Panky's parents are shocked. What are you doing here? We didn't know you were coming. In fact, we don't even have Christmas gifts because we mailed them to you weeks earlier, not expecting you to be here. They would spend Christmas Eve and Christmas Day there and then return home the very next day, making the long trip back to Greeley. On the way back, all of a sudden, Steve Panky asked her to turn on the radio. Panky just had Angela dialing through the radio stations for the rest of their trip to find news updates on Janelle's disappearance. This is a 20-hour experience for her. It was then getting into Greeley. Steve insists that she drive to a grocery store and get all the newspapers that she can that have any information about the disappearance of Janelle Matthews. Steve Pankey is a man who's generally disinterested in the news, yet in this particular case, he seems hyper alert, hyper interested in the disappearance of Janelle. So you have to ask yourself, what is that about? They returned home, it was getting late. He said, go inside, unpack the car. He didn't come inside, rather he got his coveralls on and began to dig in the front yard. Panky sat out there digging for hours on end. And finally, Angela said, Two days after they returned, she stepped outside to the backyard and noticed the car was completely on fire. And she said Panky walked up to her and said, get back in the effing house. When the fire burned out, Panky hauled it off to a salvage yard. And by that point, Panky's my number one suspect. He is the suspect. Detective Prill and I returned to execute a search warrant at Steve Panky's residence. We collected three cell phones, a MacBook, and an iPad, 13 handguns, and about 1,100 pages of documents from his house. And I would spend the next 14 months pouring over Steve Pankey's life. He was searching Janelle on the internet almost daily, way before 2019. And then ultimately, when he was exhausted, he rounded out his 24 hours by watching BDSM porn images before passing out. That says a lot to me. He's my guy. There's no doubt at that point. We traveled back out to Idaho and had him arrested for the murder and abduction of Janelle Matthews. He taunted law enforcement constantly. And then when we knocked at his door and put handcuffs on him, he could not believe that all of his tauntings had come to an end. He would make no statement. I think he had no time to plan. And from that point on, we would have no further personal contact with Steve Pankey. We just arrested the person that murdered Janelle. And now, you know, at that point, I'm realizing the most difficult part would be to actually convict Panky. 
we didn't even know him. We didn't even know his name. So you could start putting the pieces together, but still, what's the motive? Why did he choose Janelle? Was it just a crime of opportunity? He's the only one that knows the, the why. Now, I wouldn't say that the years have made it easier. After 35 years and they found her body, you know, that's when things became easy. I didn't cry much because at that time, I knew where she was. And that was a big comfort to me anyway. I was glad that they had somebody but they had to prove that it was Steve Banky that did it. I think we were both pretty excited that we had got to this point and just hoping for a positive outcome. We had to wear masks, so we didn't see him fully. So I think there was a little bit of cushion when you're just looking at somebody's eyes. And because we don't know him, there's a little bit of distance as well. I'll tell you, he looked like a broken man. I was just kind of numb. I didn't have a lot of hatred for him or anything like this because, you know, he's just another person. I wasn't going to let him affect me to the extent where I become bitter. I wasn't going to be consumed by him. When he got on the stand, nobody knew what was going to come out of his mouth. And it was 45 minutes of some really, really strange words. But when he used the phrase about letting his sin find him out, which is a biblical reference, I put my hand on my husband's knee and I said, he's going to confess. But that's not the way it, it came out. He will probably never, ever say anything because he believes he's innocent. For Steve Pinky not to admit his guilt, it's just evil. It's just cruel what he did. Police didn't have a lot to forensically link to the killer, and they had to go more on circumstantial evidence. I created a timeline, 130 pages long, had 5,000 pages of data to back up the assertions that I'm making in the timeline. We felt very confident. It was a strong case. Quite honestly, I think the evidence came out even better than we could have ever hoped for. There was a lot of evidence that was put forward. But Steve Pankey had also had his own reasonable doubt that he was trying to use in his defense. And it resulted in a hung jury. No verdict could be reached. They were not unanimous. It was nine to three in favor of conviction. However, without all 12 agreeing, it was going to result in a deadlock. I was really disappointed that it was a hung trial. But the foreman and two others said to our lawyers, you can never prove to me that he was at the premises at the time that you say he is. So that's why it was a hung jury. Our team, when the word mistrial came, did not hesitate to want to fight again. So when you see your team reacting that way, it makes you feel good and feel confident. We're doing this again. At the second trial, which began on October 4th, 2022, prosecutors came armed with even more evidence against Panky. This time, they had new information, as well as a reported confession that Panky had made to someone he shared a jail cell with years prior. This inmate said, you know, I became close with Panky in the sense of a spiritual connection. We'd pray together. And there came a point where Panky came to me and said, I need to pray for forgiveness. And the inmate asked, forgiveness for what? And Panky looked to the ground and said, that's between me and my God. 
And then Panky proceeded to pray to God for forgiveness for what he did to Janelle, according to this inmate. So in this second trial, the jury got to hear about Panky's familiarity with the Matthews neighborhood. That Panky's cousin caught Panky on several occasions, parked outside of her mother's house, two blocks from Janelle's school, and she would see him watching the, the kids walking home from school. And the jury got to hear about Panky being physically abusive to Angela. Had indicated that a girl had gone missing. Angela Hicks is an amazing woman. Both trials that she came down from Idaho to testify, she really helped make the case. There's no question about it. She helped connect the dots. When the jury announced that they had a verdict and all of us were just freaking out. I mean, I, I don't, I do not get jittery or nervous or, or scared very often, but it, it, you know, the questions are flying back. Why are they coming back so fast? The verdict forms were handed to the judge. When he read guilty for second degree kidnapping, I absolutely knew then that they would find him guilty of murder. I felt overjoyed when the conviction came back. I couldn't believe how lucky I was to have been a part of this case and to bring the closure that that family so much deserved. To have that closure, to have that verdict, it took us two times, but it's the best feeling ever. Ultimately, Panky received a 20 years to life sentence, meaning the earliest that he could be released is 2042, when he'll be 91 years old. Getting a guilty verdict of Steve Pankey was the culmination of our earthly justice for Janelle. He's still gonna have to appear before God. And, uh, but it's, that's everything that could possibly happen uh, here on earth. I don't think justice is ever served. The day after that verdict came back, Janelle was still dead. Panky's still alive. Anyone convicted of murder should be spending the rest of their days in prison, and my hope is Panky dies while he's in prison. He is a horrible, rotten human being. He's a gaslighter, he's a manipulator, he is spiteful and hateful, and the most atrocious human being I've ever encountered. As a Christian, you're supposed to forgive everybody, but I can't. I just can forgive evil, you know? Um, you know, God, do I need to forgive him? I don't know. I don't want to come across judgmental because only God knows his heart, but I think he has a lot of head knowledge that clearly has not transferred to his heart because if it did, he would never have pulled that trigger. The motive is one that we have never seen. There was no clear relationship between Steve Pankey and Janelle Matthews. What we do know is that his hatred for the church was enough for him to take the path that he did, which was to abduct Janelle Matthews and ultimately murder her. Had Pankey shut his mouth in January 1985 and never said another damn thing about Janelle, he would have never been identified in this case. He would have never been arrested. But he is so confident in his abilities and his intelligence. He was proud of what he pulled off, and he knew he could never get caught until he got caught. Despite, you know, having this tragedy in our life, being able to finally have justice for Janelle is just, such a gift and such a blessing, and I'm just so, so grateful. They found her body 35 years later. Even though it was a sad thing, I'm so happy that all this time she was in heaven. I think she would have been uh, the kind of person that people would notice. She would have been a very good mother. 
she would have shared a lot of happy moments with Jennifer. She would have been somebody that Jennifer and Gloria and I would have been proud of.